Hi, my name is Ram. I'm a data engineer at Find Hotel. And before I lived in Amsterdam, I worked in a small startup that had a, an urgent problem. I want to tell you the story of how we solved that problem. I will start by quickly explaining the project requirements, and then we will go over the architecture and why we did what we did. At the end, I will present some things that weren't obvious to me from the get-go. So, the main sale point of the product we were working on was the premise to increase the visitor's time on site. We wanted to help our partners direct their users to more content that they liked. Since this product is embedded inside the partner's page, it carries with it a few problems. We don't know when new content is added, and we have no straightforward way to find out. The obvious choice is to scrape the partner's website periodically and index changes to our database. This is very labor intensive. Having to create a scraper for each partner, this solution will obviously not scale to a time when partners will be added interactively and not manually by our sales team. We promised our, cut, our customers to always display a recommendation. This meant for us that a bad answer is better than no answer. Nonetheless, the recommendation should still be useful, otherwise nobody would click on them. These clients that embedded our product in their website have much bigger teams than ours. Their uptime is quite impressive. They serve news to a large portion of internet users. And if our system scratch, it will directly affect their pages. We knew we had to deliver this feature quickly, since the current recommendation system we had was not very reliable. It was not serving recommendations most of the time. Keeping the steps in the process stateless greatly reduced the complexity of our application. We could treat each part of the program independently. This meant we can fit the whole thing in our head and also kept the components easy to change. We did this by making sure data flows in one direction, inside the pipeline. This way, we could carry all the data we need forward throughout the transformation steps. To solve our first problem, indexing old and new articles when they are posted, we used the fact that users view these pages. Each view would then generate the post request, which indexes the currently visited page and triggers recommendation generation. I was surprised to find out that uh, published articles can have their body, tags, and even titles changed. So constantly indexing these uh, kept the recommendations fresh. We quickly, we quickly realized we don't have enough manpower or budget to maintain a public-facing Elasticsearch cluster within our small team. We were only two people. So we used Elasticsearch capabilities as a computation engine, sending simple queries, getting a list of results back, and persisting them in the object store. Persisting the results to the object store allowed us to run a tiny cluster. We could control the request rate and apply back pressure when needed. Only the Arca Streams application had access to the Elasticsearch cluster, which ensured controllable loads on the system. Saving the suggestions from the data store allowed us to focus on delivering, delivering value and not focusing on, on extinguishing fires when the system crashes. Since even if it did crash, no one would notice it because all of the other recommendation was still being served. We didn't have to do too much to set up Elasticsearch to do what we needed. We used the dynamic templates to define text fields with the correct analyzers. This way, we didn't have extra work when the model changed or when we wanted to add more languages. The English analyzer has a list of top words, predefined, and the stemming support, which fits well with the text that humans read. And we used dynamic templates. We could define the text field to be indexed in the raw form, which, help, which is helpful for things you want to match as is, like tags. Using this template, we could dynamically add languages and indexes, and we didn't have to waste our time on fiddling with too many settings, which reduced unplanned work. The query we used was very simple. We put each field from our JSON object into a term query and filtered by time range. You can see we used the raw fields for things we had to exactly match, like IDs, keywords, and the analyzed field for the title and description. We also filter out the current article we are generating suggestions for from the results, because obviously each article always matched itself, and we don't want it in the result list. So the result of this query is then sorted by score and persisted to our object store, ready to be served to all of our users. Now, when I imagine what a queue does, 
a picture something like this. A conference on streams being pulled to a central repository. The mental model for picking things from Q is far more straightforward than a web front-end. This lets us abstract away all but, the, all but the, everything but the data we have to work on, and we can only focus on that. We're in control of the data, so our application can simply request a piece of work and start working on it immediately. This allowed us to treat, to treat our incoming traffic as a stream of data, coming in one way, being transformed, and passed forward, which allows embarrassingly parallel applications like ours to digest work in parallel with very little overhead. Another advantage of using Q over connecting the computation engine directly to our HTTP front-end is that we could decouple the collection process from the transformations we wanted to apply to our entities. And finally, we could, of course, replay the queued messages in case of fail failure. So we end up with a classic lambda shape. We use the queue to merge all of our traffic and treat it as a single source. We then pass the messages from the queue to our computation engine, producing a list of recommendations, which are then persisted to our object store. This object, st <coughs> sorry. this object store should expose a public API so we will have direct access to the data. S3, which is what we used, does that out of the box, but you can also use Redis, Redis behind the Nginx or any key value engine. So serving the pre-computed recommendations from the object store further decouples serving the data from digesting it, giving us two tracks, a one-way track for ingesting data and another one for serving it. This mental model translates very naturally into Scala and Akka streams. We start with the source. In our case, we poll for changes. And once we get them, they are published downstream to the transformation steps. We convert the incoming payload to our domain object, index it. The indexing step is used for scraping our partners and keeping the Elasticsearch index up to date. We then query Elasticsearch with the same data that payload we just indexed immediately create a list of recommendations. And if it's a new article, it will produce fresh recommendations. It was never seen in the object store. But if it was already seen, it would just overwrite the same key. And then we have updated recommendations. The list of recommendations is then passed to the object store for immediate retrieval. Now, since indexing the articles and searching for them uh, have no dependency, we can tell Akka streams that this part could be done in parallel. So we just change map to map async. Easy. So what worked well? After looking at the problem and understanding it, understanding it, we threw away all the scraping code we had, and we used user pages, users page view to index our partner's content. So we got rid of technical debt. We got rid of a lot of code by just deprecating it, which is pretty nice if you ask me. Now, I noticed all our partners are using HTML meta tags. These tags are used for sharing in social networks, so the partners usually put some thought into them. They carried valuable information. So we passed the HTML tags on these pages. We extracted all the needed information on the article and generated recommendations for it. This also meant we could turn off the scraping engine, which cut, op cut operation costs, of course, and the technical data I mentioned before. The second big win was realizing we could use an object store to serve the recommendations. This saved us a lot of stress, since we only had to guarantee the object store is running, which, in, which was, in our case, a service on AWS, so we didn't have to do anything. Akka Streams is a great example of a reactive streams implementation. It maps very nicely into the meta model of stream processing and transformations, which greatly increased our productivity. Another advantage of Akka Streams is the async abstraction that lets you write the application as you normally would, but still lets you leverage all available cores. Using Docker was another good bet that paid off. It gave us uh, reproducible builds, which let us catch many bugs we would usually catch in production, like environment-sensitive configs and all sorts of dependencies that had to be bundled with the application. So packing the application logic inside Docker meant we could try different environments and depo deployments very easily. But it's not all roses. It became clear quite quickly that you can make people learn Scala, but you can't make them change their way of thinking. They have to be willing to do so. 
So although functioning programming concepts are quite easy to explain, they are not that convincing. Your colleagues will have to elevate the pain they encounter in using the, the new paradigm before they are sold on these ideas. Another thing was uh, monitoring distributed application is hard, as always. This one is no exception. The nature of stream processing can make it even more opaque. Says it <clears throat> because of its tendency to swallow errors you didn't explicitly handle. The solution for this is very simple, actually. Implementing monitoring from the get-go, and then when you encounter problems, you know where to look. So, to conclude, I want you to suggest that you try to solve a specific streaming pro problem that you have right now using a functional programming approach. This will let you experience the fluidity of the, that the paradigm allows. The more you use functional programming concept, the easier it is to think in this way, like any other thing. The direct mapping between the Lambda architecture and the ACA strings make it very easy to define the business need in terms of code. There's this um, notion in uh, Judaism, and I think in most other religions, that you have to experience things yourself in order to believe, it, believe in it. You can't explain why you should believe in something. You can't explain why you should do something. Only once you do it, you understand. So I really think that with um, functional program programming, it's, it's the same. I can talk about uh, free monads until the cows come home, but no one will use it unless they can really understand what they are, what they are solving in their own domain. And nobody wants to read the tens of uh, log files trying to spot a problem that might not even be logged. So there's a great collection of libraries that allows monitoring and instrumenting distributed applications. Kmoon is one of them, and so is HTrace. Um, you can check out Aka Stream Trace if you plan on using Aka Streams. It was designed with the streams in mind, and all you have to do is, in order to instrument your application is to add the config file. What are your questions? Hi, I have a question, which is, did you use any tooling to actually process the generated monitoring data? How did you analyze all the stuff that got, got recorded? The generated? Uh, can we have this mic on? All right, just, just you just repeat the question after. Right, if you're collecting lots of monitoring data, that becomes an analysis problem itself. Yes, yes. So. We actually use um, HTrace and uh, the library I mentioned before is sending all of the trace records to Zeppelin. Zeppelin is a really nice front end that just visualizes all of the latency um, in each step of your, of your pipeline or in your microservices. So basically, if you, can, you can just open it and have a look. And if you see like a really long um, like graphic, you know you have a hotspot there and you should uh, look into it. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, if you can speak loudly, speak and, then loudly. and then repeat it. I will remember to repeat the next question. Yeah, <laughs> try to work. Yeah. Can you say more about how you model uh, users and the documents you recommend for them? Yes, Paul. Um, this is actually, uh, Paul asked if, yes. Paul asked if, uh, if I can uh, elaborate on how we modeled users. So I didn't mention that, but it wasn't user specific. We, we, we came from the assumption that if users read the current article they are, they are reading, they are probably interested in things like that. And we just use that. Um, we could use users. Um, you simply, you simply, you simply, simply index the user, and then you hope it will be the same. Because if you, if you can tag it with whatever, if you have extra data on, on him, depends on whatever you have, you can. Mm, match age, you can match mm, what, city, whatever, and combine that with the actual articles you are, you are using. Now, I was thinking about uh, putting it in the slides, but you can actually use, for users, you can use stuff like uh, Neo4j, just take out Elasticsearch, use it instead, and because everything is uh, typed, you will only have to change this specific uh, part. Working. Sure. Yeah. Uh, 
Did you or your colleague have already Scala experience before this, or you learned Scala while you were doing this? Good question. So I had, I did have a Scala experience, but my colleagues didn't. And especially when um, the system was done and was had to go to like maintenance, um, those people didn't have any kind of Scala experience. And there was one instance when um, this really smart developer that was maintaining the code, he, he spent like two days on trying to understand the difference between uh, dot colon plus and space colon plus. And there's no difference. It's just like uh, uh, IntelliJ quirk. So um, communicating a lot is really important. And not throwing the developers into that is really nice. Uh, doing it really slowly, um, letting, letting them understand why they should use this is uh, much better than just like, Here's like a bunch of modern transformers. Please have fun with it. So, yeah, do it slowly. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank great. you, Brendan. Thank you, Ram.